So this evening's topic is about STEM and education for the future. We are very happy to have with us two speakers, Michael Tan and Tan Aikling. They will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. Xia Lei Hun. Dr. Xia Lei Hun is a senior research scientist at the Office of Education Research, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University. I shall now pass on the session to Dr. Xia. Dr. Xia, please. Very good evening to everyone. My name is Lei Hoon. I will be the moderator for today's event. Uh, with me today are two speakers who are also my colleagues at the NIE. And our first speaker today will be Dr. Michael Tan, a research scientist at the Center for Research in Pedagogy and Practice within the Office of Education Research at NIE. And the second speaker is Dr. Tan Ikling, an associate professor at the Natural Science and Science Education Academic Group within NIE. Both of them are experienced researchers in science education and are also the core team members of the Mary Stan Center, a newly set up education and research center with a mission to enhance the quality of STEM literacy in Singapore. Given their familiarity with the topic on STEM, I'm sure they will have much to share with us today during their talk and later engage us in a lively conversation during the Q&A sessions. Without much further ado, I will now invite Dr. Michael Tan to begin his sharing. Michael, please. Hi. Um, this is a very interesting uh, talk. I'm, I'm supposedly supposed to have, yeah, there's supposed to be like at least 73 or probably a lot more people right now uh, in the audience and I cannot see or hear or sense who's, who's out there. Anyway. Uh, the title of my talk today is, uh, as you can see, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? And it's a, uh, this is a taunt um, that, that, that comes to very often to, um, you know, people that are, that is used, you know, to, to taunt people who are, you know, supposedly very smart. But anyway, I'll tell you why this is in, in interesting and important for us in a moment. Uh, but let me just give a quick overview of what today is. Um, the first thing I, I want to say is that, you know, I, I know that there's a, this is a huge public talk to a very wide open segment of society. It's very hard to know what appeals, what people already know, what you don't know. Uh, if I don't deliver what you want to hear, I ask for your patience. And perhaps if you put some comments in the Q&A, Q I think let, let's see if I can, you know, answer it. So what I want to say, uh, this talk is not is is not a talk uh, to help your child succeed in STEM. That's not what this is about. Neither is this uh, what is the upcoming STEM curriculum. Um, it is about nurturing the public conversation about what STEM is good for, and a series of provocations or inspirations, aspirations to think about what STEM could be in the future. The idea being that you know we we. We kind of know, you know, from uh, public press releases that, you know, Singapore schools do very well in uh, Singapore students and Singapore schools do very well uh, in STEM. The question uh, that we would all like to ask ourselves is, okay, what's next? All right. So, um, again, you've seen this before. Um, we do very well in uh, international comparisons. Um, I don't really have very much to say to this slide. I just, you know, just a, a quick, you know, a slide to show you that we've been doing very well. But um, I also want to think about, you know, some of the ways in which perhaps we can do better. And this uh, slide comes from uh, the 2014 Creative Productivity Index. So in 2014, the Asian Development Bank commissioned the Economist um, intelligence unit to compile a, a study of um, 20 something economies, 24 economies, uh, including uh, co um, Finland and the United States as references. Okay, and to rank uh, these economies in terms of its creative productivity. So I think the headline figure that everybody looks at is that Singapore is number 10. No, uh, that's not that's not too bad. All right. Um, specifically, output, you know, in terms of creative output, you know, we are doing fairly well. We're number six uh, in among 24 economies. However, the one that really everybody should be paying attention is the, the inputs. Uh, in an, how much are we spending on infrastructural um, 
you know, on, on infrastructure to get, you know, creativity uh, done in Singapore. Uh, it looks like we spend a lot. We are the number one spender um, for creative inputs, but we're only number six uh, in outputs. So our overall ranking of creative productivity, which is the quotient or, uh, of the output over the input is we're number 10. All right. So this is something that is quite interesting and um, something to think about. Uh, or more recently in 2020, uh, there's a global innovation index that compared uh, over 200 economies all over the world, uh, including uh, a comparison of, of CT's performance in uh, comparisons such as uh, science and technology intensity. We won't go into the specific details like science and te technology intensity, but let's just take a look at, uh, once again, uh, Singapore's performance in comparison to uh, peers. Okay, so if we take a look at, you know, SG right here, if we look at the output, okay, so across three countries, Singapore, Israel, and uh, Czech Republic, our performance, the, the output is approximately, I mean, it's, it's the, in the same ballpark, same region. Uh, but however, look at the input metrics. Uh, in terms of its score, we again, uh, spend a lot more on inputs than Israel or Czech Republic. And so the question is, um, what is it that, why is it, why is this a case? And um, if we're interested in uh, STEM education for the future, STEM education for the economy, because that's very often, you know, why, what we, we often hear this, this idea that this notion that, oh, uh, we need, we need more STEM for the economy. Uh, how do we, explain this and how can we attend to this problem if we if at all we think that it is a problem uh, going forward in the future and also you know it, this is like you know a more informal you know a retort that you know people often say things like okay if singapore is doing so well in tims and pisa where are your nobel laureates why aren't we the first to develop a covid vaccine for example i mean it's complicated um but let's Let's try to see if we can give an answer from an education perspective. All right, um, it seems that we are good at setting up infrastructure and systems, but uh, we may not be as good in making use of these systems to be creative. Okay, so again, we, we are, we are, it's not that we are not creative. So once again, if you look at the Creative Productivity Index, no, sorry, the Global Innovation Index, we are actually number one in Asia in terms of uh, output indicators. But however, it costs us more money than other countries to be this creative. And um, again, the question that, that I want to ask is, you know, uh, why is that and what can we do and what can we do specifically in schools? All right, so that's the sort of uh, general background setting that you know, I want to put, you know, the, 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 my talk in. All right, so I guess I want to like pause for a minute, you know, in case anybody wants to ask any questions. I can't see where questions are going to come up, but in case anybody just wants to, you know, formulate and think of any questions, they put a post a comment somewhere that I can re attend to it in a while's time, maybe a minute for this. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just continue. All right, so definitely might be some school leaders in the audience who go like, no, 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 it doesn't happen here. You know, in my school, uh, we are, we are great. We are very creative. Uh, and that is good. That's excellent. I mean, um, please, please tell me what school that is. And I would really love to go and do research in your school. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we want to take a look at the systemic level at the national, um, in, in the, yeah, at a systemic level, uh, the, the, the results are there, you know, and, and what is it that we can do to attend to this is a question that I want to know, attend to. Also, you know, as for the parents that are in the audience, you know, the question uh, that I want to sort of think about is, as you parent your children, you know, when we teach them, um, what do we do when kids inevitably come up with answers we don't like? Okay, so what do we do when kids are creative in ways that we cannot respond to? So, okay. 
to to continue, um, I want to say that you know we need um, uh, it's it's a very different it's a very complicated response to, to tell you uh, about um, the kind of STEM education that we need. Uh, it's complicated because researchers have contended that uh, the innovation circuits that drive the economy are broken. So the 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 idea that you know if you teach people well and they do well in school, your uh, Tim's and Pisa. Uh, scores are, are excellent and everything, right? Uh, you can then uh, have an uh, education system which you know is gives people uh, access to innovative practices, and these practices uh, generate lots of money, and you know the the, the society is rich and stuff like that. Uh, that that innovation circuit seems to be broken. Uh, why? Um, the the biggest problem is the globalized flows of people and information. So very often our best and brightest, they're not staying in Singapore, they're going off to Palo Alto, they're going to Cambridge, Massachusetts or UK or something. And they are making tons of money there, you know, for other countries. But then let's think about, you know, who else is left in Singapore? I mean, the mass of people, I mean, of course, a lot of these people will come back. And, uh, but, you know, if we think about the mass of the people, the, the, like, the general scientific literacy of the, the bulk of the people who determine things like organizational culture. These people's taken for granted view of what a scientific investigation looks like, what a creative venture looks like, and the levels of risk that are involved in all these you know, creative ventures and how we should approach the unknown will strongly determine whether organizations are creative or not. All right. So what I have for you today, right, is three sort of recommendations and a caveat, okay? We, we need to think in terms of uh, culture, a capital C culture and small C cultures. Uh, and these three recommendations are as follows. One of the, we, we need to have more, a, a better conversation about the kinds of futures we should aspire to, uh, the kinds of social organizations that nurture creativity, and we need to think more about the so-called performative abilities that cannot be easily reduced to numerical outcomes. I'll talk more about these three points in the following slides. Uh, and I'll sort of end off with a, a caution about the humanities um, in that we need to be careful about uh, the human side of STEM, all right? In short, we need a holistic vision for education and society uh, in order to bring ourselves to the next step of achievement, uh, whatever it is, all right? So the first thing I want to ask is, no, no, I want, not that I want to ask, I want to propose that we, we need to have um, a better conversation about the kinds of futures uh, that involve Singapore and technology. So if you look at uh, the lots of images around, you know, so I'm sure some of you would have heard of the fourth industrial revolution that is apparently here already that involves uh, sensors, the internet of things, and you know a lot of interesting uh, technologies that come with that I don't pretend to know very much about it, but uh, I know that there's such a thing called the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. I also know something about smart nation, which I'm very curious about that. If anybody is working in smart nation out there, um, yeah, please uh, reach out. Um, I'm also very curious about uh, automation and what it does for, um, uh, what it does to the kinds of jobs uh, that, that are going to be left. Um, you see that, you know, from that, you know, little tool called a smartphone, you can get so many things done already. And, you know, when that happens, uh, that sort of means that there are going to be many people who will be out of jobs. Um, we, I'm not sure we have had a very good um, conversation about this. Okay, uh, to be honest, I haven't been paying a lot of attention, but I, I, I think that, you know, there are certain harms, right, you know, that, that, that come from technological adoption that, you know, we might want to be more careful about. So um, we need better ways of disagreeing, arguing, and resolving uh, the tensions that will come from the different goals and that we, we can you know, apply technology to. 
Um, the, the key point that I want to make here is that regulation often lacks innovation. So very often what's going to happen is that new things will come. Think about, say, for example, Facebook, you know, it, it, it started in, you know, within the, 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 the span of like half, you know, half a decade or a decade, you know, uh, it suddenly grown to, you know, something that was optional, you know, for fun, you know, that kind of thing. I, I wonder how many of you still, you know, come from the time when, you know, pre-Facebook and today it's almost like everybody needs to have a Facebook account, you know. Um, and so many businesses are done uh, via Facebook, for instance. And when that happens, right, um, there are certain negative uh, perspectives, uh, negative perspectives, negative downsides to using and, and using Facebook. Uh, but this organization is now so big that we, we can't really do anything about it. Uh, and, and that seems to be the case for, you know, many technologies, petrochemical uh, in industries, for instance, in Singapore. Uh, we have heavily invested into it. But today, if we are going to say that, oh, we need to do something about climate change and, you know, we it's going to in, in, impact our economy seriously if we are going to say oh, we're going to divest from petrochemical industries. Uh, some way of thinking about like how can we do this? How how can we change from, you know, whatever is here to whatever is less damaging to societies, uh, is something that we need to think about. So this is the first uh, big C culture that I think we should have um, a better discussion on. The second one uh, is to talk about the small, smaller C culture in the sense of organizational culture. And uh, I wonder if you, if people have rec uh, recognized uh, this. Okay, wait, here. This is the uh, Great Dome of MIT. I've not visited um, MIT, so I've never, I, I, I won't pretend I know what it is. But apparently it's this uh, grand building that is the centerpiece of MIT and occasionally you get uh, students who would do this. Uh, they'll put, uh, they'll disassemble. The first thing that they did, one of the first hacks that they did, right, was to take apart a police car and reassemble it on the roof of the dome. Uh, and on the anniversary of 9-11 for this hack that they did, right, they, MIT doesn't have its own fire department, but they managed to um, like create this, this fake um, MIT fire department truck and reassemble it on top of the, of the, the dome. The, the interesting thing is that this is all done in one night under the cover of darkness. Uh, nobody uses a crane. Somehow the, the, the students manage to find a way to get it done. So it's this kind of, you know, interesting, weird, you know, organizational culture, right, that allows people to, you know, think differently. So I wanted to talk about, and I don't really have very much time left, I'm realizing, uh, the difference between uh, organizational cultures that um, make people stupid, or uh, in this case, stupid and uncreative, or, or for an alternative, you know, perhaps the uh, Israeli case where um, there is a initiate, I mean, that people are expected to improvise even if that means uh, that people have to break rules. Um, I'm just going to skip this and talk about the caveat. Okay, so I want to say that science is essentially com incomplete. Okay, so it used to be that, you know, when we taught uh, science, right, it used to be taught alongside philosophy. Of course, uh, this so-called used to be uh, is over a hundred over years old. I mean, I'm talking about the 1800s, 1700s, where you know people started to think of uh, science as a natural philosophy. So, beyond the problem of how to invent, which is you know what we tend to focus on in in science today, we actually should be thinking more about what we should be inventing and why we should be inventing. Um, you know, in, in, in line of, you know, to, to think in terms of like, you know, why, why certain things should be made real, All right? So um, 
a weapon of mass destruction, for instance, is a, is a brilliantly creative application of science and technology. But that is not exactly something that is what we want, isn't it? All right, so um, the, the, the question becomes, you know, if, if you have, for instance, you know, if, if you are a teacher and you have, you're running a STEM class and a group of students are in your class and one comes up with an invention that is um, not what you expected, how should we respond to that? I think that is something that we have to have a better conversation and have, you know, a better means of thinking about it. Um, so these are aspirations, these are provocations. I won't pretend to say that we have a way forward, all right? Uh, again, these are opportunities for us to like open more ways of thinking about it so that at least we kind of get a, a better sense of like, you know, what, what, is, what is important and what is necessary for the future. There is much work to be done. We're not used to thinking this way and our schools are not really set up to operate this way. But I really think that it's very important for uh, us to think in this way so that we can attend to problems of the future that currently we have never seen yet. All right, so with that, um, I thank you for your attention and return the time back to the moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your thought-provoking uh, talk and questions uh, that you have raised. Uh, I will now like to pass the mic over to Dr. Tan Egling. Egling, please. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening and welcome to the talk. So, I've entitled my sharing today, Purposes of STEM Education. Mike has taken us uh, on a journey to talk about creativity and the need for creativity and innovation uh, in STEM education. He's painted for us a, a, a really um, overarching uh, situation of what STEM education is, is like right now in Singapore. So beyond creativity and beyond innovation, what is the purpose of STEM education? What is STEM education for, for the men on the street like myself? my family, yourself, and your family. How does it affect your everyday life? So that's uh, what I would like to share and for us to think about. So the, the talk I've broken up into three sessions, are uh, three sessions, three segments, okay? Um, how are you STEM literate? Um, what do you need to know in order to be STEM literate? And how do you develop STEM literacy, right? So to begin, Let's take a look at this particular news article that uh, was published not too long ago. That this article talks about, uh, or this news tells us about uh, a man who was fined for picking up a pangolin and placing it in another reservoir for safety from ants. And the prosecutor said, and his reasons for displacing the pangolin from the presence of ants. Um, the details I will not go into, but I'd like us to all think about this. How did this happen? All right, how did this happen? So uh, for those who are locked in, I'd like us to, I'd like you to key in your views about how do you, how, how did this happen? How did the pangolin get displaced from its um, niche, from its habitat? And why did the man do that? How did this happen? So if you can, you can just key in your views. I will just give one minute for people to uh, respond. You will key in on your mobile devices. Yes, unawareness, uh, I've got one response. Misconception on the man's part, insufficient knowledge of science. Men lack knowledge of um, pangolin, yes. Pangolin trafficking, that's highly probable as well. Man doesn't know food webs, okay? <laughs> Misplaced concern, very good. Sympathy, sympathy, yes. Just finding an excuse, wanted to help. Lack knowledge of pangolin's diet, yes. Ignorance, yeah. 
Great. So there are various reasons uh, we think why that particular situation happened. One of the most likely reasons is probably the man used his own experience. You know, as humans, we don't like ants and then projected it onto the pangolin with little knowledge of that, of the, the biology of the pangolin, right? That the pangolin eats ants. And so in the presence of, um, uh, it needs to be in the presence of ants so that it can be nourished. All right, so that particular knowledge is probably not applied or, or it's not used by the man, okay? So I'd like us to keep this in mind as I go on with this sharing. Why is that, why is scientific knowledge important? Uh, in our everyday life, okay? The next one that I'd like you all to also try to respond is, so with that in mind, I'd like you to think about yourself. How are you STEM literate? All right, we cannot say, oh, you know, this is what other people will do. You know, they don't have knowledge, so they make this kind of silly mistake. Look back into ourselves. How, are, how am I STEM literate? So I'd like you to think about an issue or a situation where you found yourself in doubt about what you hear, read, or ask to do. Sorry, typo. Uh. Think of a situation where you find yourself in doubt about what to hear, what you hear, read, or ask to do in any issues related to science or seemingly related to science. So can I have some responses? In teaching, we call this wait time. So we wait for a reply. Anybody like to share your thoughts? In doubt, every time I pass an advertisement. Excellent, thank you. I share that same doubt as well. Every time we claim some health supplement, I, I find myself wondering, right? Wondering, is that really true? Does shaking a car help to get more petrol into the tank? Really? So like probably drivers face this all the time, right? Online news and on social media, yes. Red cloud at night, rain is coming. I'm trying to figure out the size of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's quite interesting. When I receive an SMS that my ATM, okay. Durex plus alcohol is poisonous. Cut has been blocked. Many forests in our country are chopped down to make way for development, but yet they say we are planting many trees. Watching YouTube video that is fake. I'm trying to double check on online sources. Yes. Aliens help to make pyramids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> General distrust of COVID vaccine. Thank you everybody for, for sharing your, your situations where you are in doubt. And I think Many of us would have come across many of these. And we find ourselves wondering, am I sufficiently literate, STEM literate? Am I sufficiently, do I have sufficient knowledge of STEM to make a good personal decision for myself? So one of the things that I like to argue or I like us to think about is this, that do we, of course, is why are we in doubt? Were there contradicting claims? Uh, were we uncertain about the evidence? How often do we double check the evidence to make sure that they are not uh, 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 fabricated, to make sure that they are not fake news in that sense? Or was there insufficient evidence to make me believe that whatever I have is, is correct and it's true? Or are experts disagreeing with one another? Right? I think in this, this time, um, this special time that we live together, we know that uh, in COVID-19, in the pandemic, experts are not agreeing with each other, right, in the initial stages uh, of how the transmission is, is uh, how, the pathway, of transmission pathway. So we find ourselves wondering, who should I believe, right? Should I wear masks or should I not wear masks? Who should I believe? Um, sometimes we are in doubt because we've, we have forgotten all the science that we have learned in school or maybe we have never learned it in school. All right, so these are, these are all the possible reasons why we, we doubt we are in a situation where we can't make a good decision in a matter that relates to STEM, technology, math, science, and engineering. So the next part I'd like to go through with us is that I like to, this is the um, new science curriculum framework by the Ministry of Education. 
All right, there are three key things which I think is extremely important for us to realize. And this, this three parts of the triangle forms the practices of science. In order to be STEM literate or scientifically literate, we need to first know how science is being done. All right, so that's why we call it ways of thinking and doing. So we need to have some knowledge to say that, oh, scientists uh, carry out experiments. And how are these experiments carried out? We need to be able to question um, experimental design because the, the way that experiments are designed, the instrument that are used to measure will eventually affect the outcome, which is the knowledge. All right, so we want to know how science is being done, how the evidence is collected. On the other part of the triangle is understanding the nature of scientific knowledge. We, in order to be literate, we also need to know that science is a human construct. And because it is a human construct, the knowledge that is produced is oftentimes tentative. We need to know that science is an empirical enterprise, meaning that our understanding of the world around us is mediated. It is mediated through the equipment that, uh, that we have at the moment. So the more powerful the equipment, the more we can learn about the world around us. And the last part um, is relating science, technology, society, and environment. That scientific knowledge does not exist and stand on its own. That scientific knowledge exists in a social context, how the society views it, and how the society perceives and uptake this knowledge. It is important. Power, politics, and personal agenda oftentimes uh, drive signs in the wrong direction. And as consumers of scientific knowledge, we need to be, we need to understand this and we need to know this. Okay. So that's the three prong of, of our curriculum framework, which um, our country is trying to bring across to all our students so that they learn science with the knowledge of knowing how it is produced, what's the nature of science and how it is applied in the society. So here, how do you as an individual, as a parent, as a teacher, as an educator, as a responsible citizen of the country, develop scientific literacy or STEM literacy so that as a community, we can move together. As a nation, we can become more scientifically literate and we can participate in the democracy in a more informed manner. So one of the things that I like to um, tell us that right now, science learning the one in blue, the blue portion here, is what we do right now. We do it very, very well. I think Mike has shown how well we have done in international comparative study, right? So content understanding, our students and our schools and our teachers, well done. We've done really, really well. And for all of us uh, in this uh, uh, talk now, we are products of the education system. And I think that we, we know our content very, very well. Science has been taught, because of that, science, science math has been taught as monodisciplinary, right? We are, we are taught uh, the subject of science, taught the subject of math, design, and technology. And oftentimes, we are taught using simple convergent problem solving, right? In maths, we do many, many pro maths problem sums, right? In science, we, in physics, in chemistry, we also solve a lot of problems. But these problems all have very simple, un not simple answers. They all have one single answer. And within the five, 10 minutes, we'll be able to come up with a solution. And oftentimes, science is presented as unproblematic, right? That's why for multiple choice, right? There's one correct answer. Okay, and that a lot of times our curriculum is teacher uh, directed. So one of the things that we are, we are aspiring towards is more authentic science learning experience so that they become, our students become more literate, we become more literate to make decisions in our everyday life. So in order to develop that, I think our curriculum needs to also focus on the social aspects of science through the use of big, uh, methods such as so, uh, a social scientific issue, getting students to understand, dissect, and appreciate social scientific issues, right? And that science learning needs to be more interdisciplinary. So um, real-world problems don't exist as a discipline, but they exist as multidiscipline, transdiscipline, all right? And that we, should, we need to get our students and ourselves involved with solving complex, persistent, and extended real-world problems. So this means that we cannot get the answer or the solution in five minutes. But we need to sit down over an extended period of time 
one week, one month, three months to try to generate the plausible solution. And we need to understand, make our learners understand that science is a human construct. Therefore, scientific knowledge is, is not um, cast in stone, that it is tentative. Okay, it's tentative yet robust. And of course, we want to also make sure that students have greater engagement and ownership in, in the process of synthesizing that particular knowledge. So that's my little uh, sharing I have to do, uh, I, I have prepared for you. So three key points, all right, that we are all to a certain extent STEM literate and that um, in order to make ourselves even more literate, okay, we, there are three things. We need to understand ways of thinking and doing science, the nature of science, and how science is applied uh, in uh, society. And in order to do that, we need to learn science in a more interdisciplinary, uh, complex problem situation. Thank you.